we get into the meat of it. I am just doing a few more setup things that I didn't have the mind to do earlier, so bear with me. Uh, oh wait, nope, that's not what I want. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So I'm I'm very pleased. I'm not visible. Why? Yes, I'm very pleased to see that uh, so many people are here to watch me and just me. Or I might be wrong. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. I'd say whoever gets the most claps, but I can't hear any of you. Regardless, I do truly hope that you uh, have as much fun listening to me uh, present as I had learning and presenting and all that jazz. So without further ado, here is my base exploration. So before I unexpectedly joined the Green Meadow community, I was not actually planning to do a senior project. Starting last year, my old school, Rockland Country Day, allowed seniors to go off campus and do internships instead of having to do a senior project, which we called WISE, but that was provided their GPA was high enough. This meant that if I kept my grades up, I would have been able to avoid the WISE project altogether and go straight into the internship. Because of this, I had not needed to take the time to think about what I could have done for the WISE project. However, since RCDS closed at the end of that summer, I soon found myself at Green Meadow, once again needing to think of a good senior project. In typical Jonah fashion, of which a few of you may be very familiar, I began to think of ways to make it as easy yet interesting as possible. Another requirement of Green Meadow was having private music lessons. Despite playing the upright bass since eighth grade, I had never actually taken a real lesson. My ability to read music came from many years of learning and playing piano. On the bass, I learned what I needed in order to play the pieces in class, not necessarily how to play the bass. This year, my work with Mr. Cameron Brown encompassed both my senior project and required lessons. Now that is what I call good time management. Early basses were first used in the 1500s. Until the 20th century, it only had three strings while most modern basses have four. Although it looks like a big violin, the double bass has its origins not only in the violin family, but also the viol family. In fact, its exact lineage remains uncertain, but aspects of both are definitely evident. Unlike a violin or cello, the bass has sloped shoulders, like this. On a violin or cello, they would be more rounded, like that. Unlike a viol, the bass has F holes rather than C holes, referring to the hollow holes on the front of the instrument, which help with the acoustics, which you can see here. Most double basses, including this one, the one I've been studying for all this time, are hollow wooden shells. But there are also electric double basses, which are just frames that support the strings and electronics that pick up vibrations. Until the 1760s, the bass was not highlighted as a solo instrument, and its primary purpose was to just double the bass sound in an orchestra. This changed, however, when composers such as Franz Joseph Haydn wrote solos for the bass into their symphonies. Many classical composers studied the double bass, yet few of them gave the instrument its time in the spotlight. Composers like Domenico Dragonetti and Giovanni Bottasini were highly involved in the popularization of the instrument. Dragonetti was an Italian composer and double bass virtuoso in the late 1700s to mid 1800s. He was a great influence on other composers of his time. His skill on the bass even inspired Beethoven to separate the bass from the cello in his third symphony. In my opinion, Dragonetti was an unsung hero of the classical world. Unless you've studied him, you've probably never heard of him and his contributions to music as a whole. Bottasini was another Italian composer and double bass virtuoso in the early to late 1800s. His fame persists even today, 
as many of his solo pieces remain staples in the musical libraries of modern double bassists and are often chosen for audition pieces in conservatory programs. My presentation will not be complete, however, without mentioning both Gary Carr and Edgar Meyer, two names heralded in today's circles of modern classical bassists. Gary Carr, now retired, has been a world-renowned bassist since the peak of his career. A seventh-generation bassist, Carr has been considered the Dragonetti of the modern age because of his innovation in modern classical bass music. His contributions to the field have fundamentally changed the way the potential of the instrument is viewed. Edgar Meyer is a highly sought after bassist and composer. His fame stems from his musical skill, technique, and composing ability. Among the people Meyer has played with is Yo-Yo Ma, the world famous cellist. In 2015, Meyer was awarded his fifth Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Instrumental Album. Unlike Gary Carr, Meyer plays in many different musical genres and continues to tour to this day. <clears throat> it was in the early 1920s when the use of the double bass was further highlighted in a fresh new genre of music, jazz. In jazz, more modern use of the double bass is very common. In the 40s, however, the bass achieved notoriety as more of a solo instrument. This newfound use was furthered by the likes of Jimmy Blanton, Paul Chambers, and Charles Mingus, all well-known innovators in the jazz world. Blanton, who lived from 1918 to 1942, brought the bass further forward as a solo instrument. During the time period when he played, the bass line usually held the rhythm for the other instruments, which created a fuller sound. Moreover, Blanton's gift of highlighting the bass as a melodic instrument, probably due to his violin training, increased its popularity as a solo sound. Chambers, who lived from 1935 to 1969, was another iconic jazz bassist. He followed Blanton and is best known for setting the bar for future bassists. His tone quality and approach to playing are still emulated to this day. Finally, the notoriously ill-tempered Charles Mingus, was one of the most recognizable names in jazz bassists and composers of the 20th century. He played alongside numerous other jazz legends, such as Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, and Duke Ellington. For those who have been paying attention, my mentor for this project has been Mr. Cameron Brown, another amazing bassist. Mr. Brown is known around the world for his work as a soloist, composer, and member of modern jazz ensembles, including the Don Pollen and George Adams Quartet. In addition to the two ensembles he leads, he also has a passion for helping young people discover and pursue jazz. His work spans around the globe, and in the U.S. includes summer jazz workshops in Vermont, the New York City New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music, and students just like me at Green Meadow trying to multitask and complete their senior project, for which I am very grateful. Along with learning from Miss Stern how to consistently play a steady and resonant bass line in the orchestra, I began working with Mr. Brown in the fall, and we had regular lessons every week. Even though I never had a proper lesson, he was really impressed with my skills. He could see that I knew all the basics, but my bow handling wasn't great. <clears throat> he suggested I play using the German style of bow, rather than the French bow I'd been using all this time. The two styles vary in length and weight. The French bow, seen here, looks like a bigger but shorter version of a regular string instrument bow, and is held similarly overhand, while the German bow, another similarity of the viol family, is held underhand with a much wider handle. Unfortunately, I don't have one with me, but it's held similarly to this. It took some getting used to, but after a few lessons, I soon got the hang of it. A few months ago, I had the opportunity to see Mr. Brown perform live alongside pianist Harvey Diamond at a jazz club in New York City. It was incredible to watch him completely dive into his element. During the performance, I observed the almost meditative improvised solos that both the pianist and bassist played. They weaved in and out of the written music, bringing the audience along for the ride. This was a great experience for me because I was able to be surrounded by the music that I had spent so long studying. I found my lessons with Mr. Brown to be informative, engaging, helpful, and of course, very fun. All things you'd want in a, in a music lesson. 
working with him extended my knowledge of the bass as well as my ability to play, which hopefully most lessons should do. We worked on typical things like scales, bowing, arpeggios, stuff like that. For today's performance, we chose two etudes by Edward Hanani, a classical French bassist and composer who lived from 1872 to 1942. The first is in D major, and the second is in A minor. If you bear with me, I hope you'll enjoy them. As I get set up for the next one, I hope you'll reflect. Here we go. Please enjoy Etude in A minor. Since starting on the double bass four years ago, I have been more and more involved in other forms of, shall I say, bass appreciation. I started by adjusting the speakers in my mom's car to increase the bass volume so I could really feel and experience that sound. 
I also began to listen to some great rock bassists, including Flea of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Chris Walston, Home of the Muse, and John Deacon of Queen, which was already my favorite band. More importantly, it also inspired me to start playing the bass guitar. This guided me to discovering some more great songs with heavy bass. Eventually, I started a band, and in the process, made and reinforced friendships that last to this day. As the future creeps closer, so does college. Moving forward, I have been considering pursuing music, but that still remains to be seen. Regardless, I still fully intend to continue exploring the double bass, as I let the low sound reverberate within my soul. Thank you very much. And a huge, huge thank you to all of the people who helped me make this happen, including obviously Mr. Brown and Miss Jackie Stern, the orchestra teacher, and Miss Cologne and Miss Lynn, who have been my, on my back this entire time pushing me to get this done. So from the bottom of my heart, thank all of you so much and thank you all for tuning in to, to uh, watch little old me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jonah. That was incredible. Um, so we have one question so far, a couple more coming in. So one question is, how long have you been playing? Um, well, I picked up, I first started the double bass when I joined RCDS in my eighth grade year. So whatever year that was, was when I started playing. Um, I took a short hiatus from the double bass for a year and a half. Um, that's when I got super, super interested. Like I was really tunneled, focused on the bass guitar, um, which I played exclusively for, I think, 10th grade or 11th grade. Um, but I never, I never really stopped playing this because we always brought it back for either to mess around with or to play a specific song in the, the concerts. But, um, I, I really got into it for the first time at the beginning of this year when I started the lessons. Great. Um, Mr. Rose says, that was wonderful. What types of music is your band playing? Um, well, we're mostly, uh, we're mostly like a punk rock sort of thing. Um, we, we mess around with a lot of various rock branches, um, but we we're trying to have a, a basis around like a ska, punky, rock vibe. So that's, that's neat. Um, I see more questions. I, I stopped playing piano for, for a couple of years. For many years, I stopped taking lessons. But I think last year I decided that I'm, I kind of missed this. So I, I picked up some of my old, uh, learning material from when I used to take lessons and messed around with that. Um, it didn't get very far, but it, it's still a nice release for me. It's nice to relax and enjoy the piano again. Um, and the second part of the question is how experience on both instruments inspired me. Well, I'm a very musical person. I love music and I love playing it and listening to it and being with it in any sense. So. It's, it, it just drives me to have something to, uh, that I want to be good at, is playing both bases. So that's fun. Um, what made me interested in the bass? Nothing. I, I, when, I, when I went to RCVS, um, I found that was the first school I was ever in that had a required um, music class. And my, the advice from my mother was, Play something different, don't uh, because everyone will be playing the specific, these certain in instruments. But everyone's want, going to want to choose you for things if you choose something that's different. So I chose the double bass, and it's uh, been downhill ever since. No, I'm kidding. Um, um, so yeah. So thanks so much for all your uh, kind words and questions. Um, have good days. Thank you again, Jonah. That was incredible. Okay, so now we're going to be moving on to Hunter Ward. Um, so I will make you 
front and center. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully this works. Yeah, it works. Um, <laughs> um, slight spoiler warning. I'm a little nervous, as I always am. Um, if I end up speaking a little too fast or you're or I end up speaking too fast that you don't understand me, please put it down into the, into, into the questions and answers thing and I'll hopefully be able to uh, get those answers to you at the very end. Um, very early into my childhood, I found a really uh, a very fine interest in the minutia. It was very often that you would find me working on another small project that in the middle of class. And you can also hear the teacher chastising me for doing it and not doing the work that they assigned. Of course, they made me put it away, but that never stopped me from doing it the very next class. Uh, as I continue, went to Green Meadow, I was able to fully develop my skills through the arts mm -hmm. from watercolor to just the small projects that I ended up doing kind of on the side throughout the days. And because of that, I decided to explore crochet as my senior project. Um, now crochet is the process of creating a textile by using a crochet hook to interlock loops of yarn thread or strands of another material. Um, the key difference between crochet, which you see on the left, and knitting on the right, is that each stitch in crochet is completed fully before the next one has begun, while knitting keeps many stitches open at one time before at the very end you would close them all. Though there are certain stitches in crochet that require um, multiple stitches to be open at one time, and then that group of, of open stitches would be considered that one um, yarn has, I mean, crochet <laughs> has been used to create different things like clothing, bags, stuffed animals, decorations, and graffiti, surprisingly. And you're probably wondering what I mean by graffiti. What I mean by graffiti <laughs> is that in certain cities, around certain times, cert people will come around and start putting crochet onto things that you might see every day. Um, I've picked three different tree pictures of yarn because they were the most highly decorated ones. There are other types of graffiti of, from, of crochet being on fences to fire hydrants to a bunch of other things as well. But these three pictures that I have up here are, are the most decorated I could find and would help me uh, <laughs> satisfy the point of crochet as graffiti. Um, there are many different types of crochet hooks. Um, each hook is marked with a certain size, both with a, with a letter as well with a number. Um, each, the number that on each hook represents the size of the stitch that it creates. Um, in these two photos, I have three of my crochet hooks. I have a lot, but here are three of them. Um, on the left, you can see is a two and a half millimeter hook. On the right is a six millimeter hook. And in the middle is my trusty four millimeter hook, which I usually use for most of my projects. Now, in terms of yarn, yarn comes in six different weights. Super bulky, bulky, medium, light, fine, super fine, and lace. Um, super bulky, is, is mostly used to create pieces of clothing or large blankets that is, would be designed to keep you warm because of its thicker material. Um, it's a little bit difficult to work with, mostly because of, of its size in general, as well as the need of having to use a bigger hook to work with it. Medium weighted yarn is what you would usually find in the store. 
like Target or Walmart. In order to find the other weights like Super Bulky or Lace, you would need to go to an art store or a more specialized yarn store. Uh, most projects are made from this type of yarn, mostly because of its, of its availability. Um, fine, super fine, and lace are the last three weights that I'll discuss. Uh, due to their thickness, they require a very small hook. It's difficult to work with these, as, as because mostly because of the thickness of the, of the threads themselves. As you work with them, if you pull too hard, they will fall apart in your hands if you tug too hard. And there's nothing worse than having yarn fall apart on you when you're midway through your project. Of course, there's also natural yarn and acrylic yarn. Uh, natural yarn is what, what usually comes to mind with silk, wool, bamboo fibers, cotton, plant material. Um, there's also acrylic yarn, which is made from a man-made plastic fiber. Um, many people use acrylic yarn mostly because of its affordability, the color range, and the durability that it offers for projects. Um, for my two projects, I decided to work with acrylic yarn. Of course, whenever you decide to start a project, it's great to create a picture or at least a drawing of what you expect your final piece to look like. Um, at the very beginning, I contacted my grandmother, who is my mentor, because um, I wanted ideas for what my first project should be. Uh, what we came up with was a small blanket that was made exclusively from hexagons. Uh, here are some of the pictures of that process. Uh, as you can tell, it ended up being a whole bunch of hexagons in many colors. And here is the picture of the final product. I apologize if it's a little fuzzy on your screen. My camera, it, I haven't used it very often, so my phot photography skills aren't very great. Of course, my project didn't end up looking exactly how it was supposed to. So I, about halfway through my project, I ended up coming with a problem. That problem was I ran out of yarn about halfway through. Um, so in, in the project, you might be able to see if your screen allows you that there's five different colors there, whereas in the original pattern, I had three. Um, I unfortunately had <laughs> to order more yarn, but because of the time frame of which I had originally ordered my yarn a few months prior, the yarn that I got came from a different dye lot, which meant that it was a similar color, but it wasn't the col exact color that I was looking for. Of course, I didn't want to do extra work since I had already made oh, at least half of these hexagons that I needed. So I ended up changing my pattern in order to satisfy what I had with what I will need. And this is what it looked like ultimately. And just a brief reminder of what my original plan looked like. About towards the end of the first project, one afternoon, Miss Wolfie called me, contacted me and we made a meeting and she started showing me these patterns of quilts from Keys Bend, which are like historic and they're, and overall are very artistic and very abstract in, in a way. And also around the same time, I found a few interesting images from Pinterest. Uh, from these two, the two ideas that I ended up having, I grew very inspired and I wanted to create a second pat a second project. Now, before I started began making my second project, I started making different squares to test to see what colors that I wanted, as well as kind of the overall pattern that I wanted to go with, since I would have to make a whole bunch of these and I didn't want to make each one unique because that's draining on the brain. Um, the top two were a little bit of a test. It was a more from, of a test of color rather than pattern. Um, and the bottom two, the white and the purple, were experiments on patterns. 
towards the very end of my testing, I came to a conclusion that I would be making my project in black and white. Now, why would I choose black and white? I chose black and white mainly because I wanted to create a piece that was, that was simple, but looked more complex. I could create another piece with color, but I decided I wanted to explore using black and white. Now, here is one of the pieces <laughs> of, that I made in black and white. Now, you're probably wondering, <laughs> since I keep pulling on these pictures of these very abstract, cool looking uh, squares, uh, I found out that these squares were made from a type of crochet called mosaic crochet. Uh, specifically, they're um, crafted from in rows, meaning you make one row and then as you make them, you bring your yarn down and attach it and it looks really cool towards the end. Um, but the squares that I was looking at were made in more of a circular motion. Uh, although it looks complicated, <laughs> uh, in reality, it's as simple as counting, one, two, three. Uh, it's created from certain patterns of single crochets and double crochets, two of the stitches you can learn as a beginner. Now, <laughs> I'll use this close-up picture as my reference since I obviously, yeah. <laughs> uh, Toward what you can see right above that white, those white stitches, those are single crochets. This longer stitch is what you would call a double crochet. And as you can see, it's attached into the row below it. And I mean, as you continue this, a pattern like this, you would end up making a piece that slowly grows wider and wider. Now, I learned this pattern from Tina Thordfadar, a fiber artist from Iceland. Uh, she has published three different books as well as edited one. Uh, very recently, she has started a YouTube series that teaches all that there kind of needs to know about mosaic crochet, from reading charts to how to attach pieces, as well as some of her past projects that she has made. Um, Creating each piece was repetitive, um, but I think the result was worth it. It combines complexity with simplicity, and overall, I find it super simply mesmerizing. Uh, each project took many weeks to put together. And here's an image of the final piece. Uh, here's a little close up of the corner, mostly because I didn't trust my photography skills to make sure that's visible from a wide view. That's the corner, and there's again. Um, a few thank yous. Uh, <laughs> thank you to my classmates for keeping my days lively and listening to my nonsense. Uh, thank you to my family for keeping me company and keeping me on my toes. Uh, my grandmother for teaching me how to crochet and taking care of me. Thank you to Ms. Cologne for keeping me on track and keeping me in touch with me making sure I was not messing around too much. Now, you, if you are interested in Tina Thorvarar, uh, here's her YouTube channel, as well as the tutorial that I had watched, would recommend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hunter. That was incredible. And your artwork is really amazing. A um, couple of questions came in from Ariel. Did Green Meadows hands-on education nurture your love for handwork? Kind of. Um, I admit that going through ninth through 12th grade, I never touched uh, the, the handy work that the students learn in the middle school slash the elementary school. So I never, I kind of missed that point of uh, interest, but definitely um, being part of the handiwork art class was a little bit of an inspiration for it. Great. And someone else asked, do you knit and crochet? Um, unfortunately, I don't know how to knit. <laughs> uh, um, I had 
I have a little bit of a problem trying to figure out knitting. I haven't tried it, I think, once in ninth grade, but I have a problem keeping the stitches open as I work with them. So <laughs> I ended up uh, following crochet mostly because um, as you move, as you go, you close the stitches. So I, I don't have to worry about my piece falling, up, falling apart on me. Um, <laughs> and at what age did you start crocheting? Ooh. I would like to say somewhere between eighth and ninth grade. I had I have to say, um, I admit I didn't exactly touch crochet so much in ninth grade. It was mostly origami. Um, but I think after ninth grade, it definitely kickstarted because I think it was just easier <laughs> to, to just bring with me. Um, someone's asking if you sell your work anywhere. Um, I actually have been asked this question a few times, um, also outside of school. Um, I would have to put a maybe. At the moment, I don't. But maybe in the future, I will if I find, come up or find a pattern that I enjoy making very often and maybe in the future. <laughs> um, someone else asked, when do you like to crochet and how long do you do it in one sitting? Ooh. I admit I am a bit of a, of a procrastinator, so I will do crochet if I don't feel like doing the work that I kind of need to do. Um, but depend, depending on the things, Sometimes I can do it for pretty much majority of the day. Sometimes if I'm not feeling it, maybe at least, I'll maybe stick in at least maybe an hour. Um, but it really depends on kind of how I'm feeling and kind of how, what is the work that I kind of have to do. Um. <laughs> You're getting lots of compliments on your beautiful work as well. Um, do you plan to explore crochet more in college? Uh, a teeny bit. Um, I have done a little kind of as towards the end of creating my second project, I ended up going to Pinterest a few times and I kind of found um, a little bit of a type of crochet. It's more of like a free form crochet. And it's mostly because it looks like coral if you like have it bunched together. And I just found it very interesting and I might try to explore it if I can find and sort of somewhat easy tutorial to follow. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Do you have plans to create some crochet graffiti in the future? Um, maybe in the far future. And it really depends on kind of where I end up being in, in the future. Um, and also what my interests are at that point. Um, maybe. Um, Though I do technically see myself as a 70 year old doing it, because that would be fun. Uh, <laughs> so probably. <laughs> Great. Uh, Ms. Monteleon asks, was this a good activity during all of the downtime that we've had recently? And did you find it meditative? Um, yes and no. Uh, De especially like definitely with kind of what kind of happened, I ended up having a lot more time on my hands. Um, but it, I think it was because of since I had that a lot more time to my own interests, I could like, put a lot more detail into my work. Um, and especially gave me a lot, a lot of the time that I needed to create that second project. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you find it meditative? Um, it's about half and half, where like I have find it meditative, half enough time for me to kind of zone out and listen to music. So it's about half and half. Great. Uh, Mr. Rowe asks, is the process or the product more satisfying for you? I would also have to say again, a little bit of a half and a half, um, because at least, like, I, because I had a lot of um, fun kind of like trying to figure out what type of border I kind of wanted and kind of searching for what pattern I kind of wanted. Um, but also kind of having, just having the end result is also just amazing, so. Yes. Ms. Caldwell asks, how do you feel and what kinds of things do you think about when you're crocheting? 
Mm. I usually end up thinking about a lot of things because it's usually just me sitting down with yarn in my hands. Um, but majority of the time, I do probably end up listening to music. I think my thoughts end up through that because I end up searching for music for at least majority of the time. So, yeah. Okay, Ian's suggesting that you put your stuff up on Etsy. Uh, how long does it take to complete a crochet doll? Um, depending on the doll, at least with, with the kind of the speed slash time that I end up putting into it, I'd have to say, like if it's about maybe a medium sized doll, like within a week, <laughs> maybe. It really depends on the size. Like a small one, I might be able to finish within a day, but as it as the bigger that you make it, the more time you will have to put into it to finish it. Okay. And um, Mrs. Leaf says, Hunter, your final piece is simply stunning. Thank you for this inspiration. I love how your pieces had some inspiration from the quilts of Guise Bend. Do you think you might work in a more abstract way in the future? Maybe. I think I have to at least look for more inspiration to kind of look off of. Um, I think mostly because I had found partially of that those pictures from Pinterest that around the same time that Ms. Holpe had shown me those pictures. I think I was ended up being more pulled by those pictures. But maybe in the future, if I find um, something that interests me, I might be to make something a little bit more abstract. Okay, I'm just gonna combine these two. How did you start crocheting and who gave you the idea of doing crochet? Um, it was, I, learned, and I ended up learning crochet from my grandmother. It, it was a little weird of a backstory because we were kind of in, in the library. Um, she kind of pulled out a ball of yarn and gave me a crochet hook. Um, I'm pretty sure we were there for either a, either a movie or some showing and we ended up being there a little early. So she pulled it out and then she started teaching me. She tried teaching my siblings, but I think they were having, I think they were playing like a card game. So they were a little busy at the moment, so. Okay. Yeah. What is the biggest crochet project you've done? <laughs> my biggest crochet project? Um, I have to say my second project, the black and white one, that's the biggest I have right now. It's a lot bigger than I originally planned for it because I thought it was like another small blanket, like the green one, but this one is easily at least twice the size of that one. So. Um, someone's asking if they could see the, the pieces again. I don't know if you could pull up the picture. Um, and then what's your favorite piece that you made and what are you most proud of? It's the last question. Uh, I guess I'll answer this a little out of order. Um, my favorite project is the black and white one, mostly because of the border. Um, cause I just, cause it was, it took me a very long time to find that pattern as well as kind of just put it together because it's, it requires so much yarn. So I'll show the, those pieces. Uh, Speed span straight through. So there's the green, the green one, um, just overall. Wait <laughs> for a second. Um, now it's speeding past straight into the future. Da -da 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 -da. And <laughs> here's the black and white one. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, one last question. Does anyone else in your family um, have a love for crocheting? I guess other than your grandmother. Um, maybe. I think, I think maybe. It's a little hard because usually they're a lot more busier than I am, so possibly. But, I, but majority of their afternoons are filled with other things that they do. Um, like McKenna usually draws and Gavin usually also draws. Um, so maybe, but their their week weekends and afternoons are a lot busier than mine. So. <laughs> okay.
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Hunter, uh, for sharing that beautiful artwork and your story and the process. It was really incredible. And we will move on to Lizuli now. Okay. Hey, this is, you can hear me, it's all good? All right. Good morning, everyone. I would love to be in Rose Hall right now, but I'm so happy that we can gather together in this way. So thank you for coming and wonderful job, Hunter and Jonah. That was beautiful. All right. I would like to start this by showing you a drawing that I did when I was about five or six. And there it is. And this drawing is called Nyack and Sweden. And I guess Nyack because I live in Nyack and Sweden because at that time I had just come back from a trip with my family to Sweden. I feel that this drawing represented my world at that age. Um, and it was about where I am and where I had just been. And so this is really what my senior project is all about. It's about looking into the world um, through the eyes of a child. For my senior project, I've studied the development um, of a child through writing and illustrating my own children's book. I chose this project because I wanted to create something that I could physically have, um, that I could see, something that I have not done before, and also something that I could possibly never do again. And so at the beginning of this project, I really had to just jump in. I had a few storyline ideas that interested me, um, but I felt a little bit lost because it's such a large topic to just dive into and I didn't know where to start. So what I did was one of my, um, what some of you might have done is Google search <laughs> how to write and illustrate a children's book. And so obviously there was obviously um, hundreds of results, uh, what to do, what not to do. It was very overwhelming. So there wasn't really any spark. There wasn't any aha moment that granted me with everything that I needed to know um, and what direction to follow other than having been a child myself once and frequently uh, babysitting children, I really didn't know much about children at all. I realized that I wasn't struggling with how to write a children's book, but I was struggling with uh, finding out what would be pleasing or beneficial or enjoyable to children. I didn't know what to write and what not to write and for what age. So, I went to my local public library and I checked out all of the children's book classics I could think of, like Curious George, Dr. Seuss, Beatrix Potter. Um, I got a few looks, this 17 year old walking out of the library with a stack of Dr. Seuss this high. Looks like I'm preparing for some drought in children's literature. Um, so I went home and I read the books and I went up to my attic too and I dug out every single children's book that I still had from my childhood. My mom saved every single one. So uh, I observed the different books and I observed what they all had in common and I tried to remember what I loved about my favorites as a child like Martha Calling, Dr. DeSoto, Mole and Shrew, uh, If You give a, give a Moose a Muffin. Part of the joy of reading uh, children's book, children's books when I was young was how I read it with my parents and how they would do funny voices and accents for the different characters. This, everything, it, it was very helpful, but I still felt a bit overwhelmed. Uh, so I wrote down a few questions that had been circulating around in my head just to get them down on paper. And I planned to ask them to people in my life and people around me and teachers I knew who had knowledge about children and literature. So the questions are, what is the difference between an adult and a child? Why do we need children's books? Why do children's books e exist? What is the benefit of reading children's books to children? How does the exposure of children's literature affect the developmental growth of a child? And how does it affect their self-esteem or their maturity? Uh, and final, finally, why do children play more 
and seem to be more imaginative than adults? And is that necessarily true? I also asked my friends and my family, what is something that you wish had been more represented in children's books um, as a child? Or what was your favorite book? And what did you enjoy in your favorite book? What do you think is important to include in children's books? So one of my friends mentioned how valuable it was for him to have a children's book that talked about crying and how perfectly valid it is to express emotion. Another friend said that um, a favorite thing about children's books for her was the illustrations because it made the, the story feel more real. Miss Christofides, my in-school mentor, introduced me to Miss Bruchelle Fox, who is an incredibly knowledgeable Waldorf kindergarten teacher uh, here at the school. And so we set up a meeting and through my conversation with her, um, and through asking her all of my questions, I felt like the gates had opened and I felt completely inspired and directed and satisfied with what I was learning. One of the things that I learned from Ms. Brichelle Fox was how children are not bound by time. She told me that children had asked her before, what is today? What is tomorrow? Is it yesterday? Uh, the concept of time hasn't fully landed for them. So by adults around them constantly saying, hurry up, we're going to be late. We have to get to this appointment at eight o'clock. It's very confusing for a child. Children are so connected to the forces of nature and the universe that they live in this sort of timeless space. The days of the week are not facts, but simply human concepts that are put onto when the sun sets and rises. So of course for children, um, they're not aware of this. This was incredibly helpful for me because my original storyline had a lot to do with time and time frames. And so I was very grateful for that information that really helps me uh, get steered in, the better, in a better direction. Another big question I have that I mentioned before uh, that I asked Ms. Brichelle Fox was, what is the difference between an adult and a child? This is obviously an enormous question, but her answer was perfectly clear and, uh, and deeply helpful. She said, children are more religious. Children are more religious. Uh, not talking about an org organized religion or a certain faith, but instead that children are more devotional to everything in their life. They become devoted to the sound of a bubbling stream or to a shiny rock that they find on the ground. At this age of around five or six, the child uh, learns through imitation rather than direction. In school, the kindergarten or nursery teacher must make sure not to instruct the children, but to instead guide the children and they will follow, stimulating a sense of directedness that has not yet developed within the child yet. I look at this meeting um, as a pivotal part in my project. This is when I really understood what my next steps were uh, and I was no longer reaching around in the dark. So as I had said from this conversation, I realized many things, many things about my storyline um, were wrong and I had to just completely scrap it. And I originally wanted to have the book be for anyone. I wanted anybody to be able to read it. But after reading around, I, uh, I learned that many sources encouraged authors not to do this. Because if you focus, you know, if you say anybody, then you're not focusing on a specific age group. And you have to make sure that what you're writing about is developmentally um, accurate for the child at that age. So. Um, if I wrote it in a beautiful and interesting way, then anybody would be able to enjoy it. So I chose to focus on kindergarten age children, so around five or six. I had started out with an idea of what my project was going to be, write and illustrate a children's book. But in the beginning of my project, I skipped a crucial step. I cannot write for a child if I do not understand uh, what a child is able to absorb and to appreciate. I need to know about children to write a book for them. 
and how could I write something for a child without understanding them? For a while, I um, had to put what I thought was the most important part of my project, which was the writing and the illustrating, I had to put that completely on hold. And it was essential for me to study child development, both spiritually and mentally. I studied two books um, of Rudolf Steiner's lectures. One was The Knowledge of the Human Being Through Art, and the second was uh, Poetry and Meaning of Fairy Tales. And I also sort of kept an ear out in my own Waldorf education and observed my own um, growth and looked back at, uh, at how, I, how I felt when I was a child. So through all of this research, I learned that children have this magical intuition. They are instinctual and they're connected to the rhythms of nature. When a child is born, uh, they immediately know how to um, feed off of their parents' breast. They know how to crawl. Although uh, this being, this baby, is very seemingly individual, um, in an ind individual form of a human, the child does not recognize that. And so they feel no separation between themselves and the world, as maybe an older individual would. When we grow older, we become more distant from that instinct and we can feel directionless. Since children have not yet been taught to separate themselves from people, from the world, they have an abundance of compassion. I find that some of the deepest and most essential life lessons we can learn from spending time with children. And this is what we ultimately all want, I think. We want to have the quality of thinking like a child we want to have that connectedness and that trust and that divine intuition that a child has that maybe they aren't even aware that they have. And so how do we preserve that connectedness and that pure love that pours from a child when we start to gift them with things like media and books and toys? How do we keep their imagination alive and thriving and raw and natural um, without putting constraints on it. So uh, Steiner says in the knowledge of the human being through art, he says education, or I like to think children's books, become evil when we try as far as possible to turn the people into a copy of our own opinions and feelings. So this uh, phrase, this sentence became the sole, uh, sole mantra in my project. I wanted to create something that would be beneficial for a child, but not push any concepts onto them. I simply want the child to enjoy my book and for it to match the develop developmental level that they're at. My work with my out-of-school mentor, mentor uh, Sarah Perilli, who is a Green Meadow alum, an artist, an art teacher, um, and a children's book illustrator, really uh, transformed how my project took form in my mind and she introduced me to the inner workings of uh, what I would have to do to get my book rolling and through our conversations we, she revealed to me many things she learned um, from being a teacher and working as an illustrator in the children's, children's book world. She shared with me different ways in which children experience the world and she also said something that was incredibly helpful and insightful for me. She said, um, imagine as if your project is finished. Imagine as if your project is finished. And so for me, I was sort of flailing around. I didn't know what to do. I was trying to go, you know, here and there and get all this done. And I was losing sight of my goal. And so by her saying that, I was able to take a step back and to look at my project and look into the future and see what I want it to accomplish. What is the essence of my project and what do I want um, it to bring to the world? So I was able to look into the future and see uh, maybe not exactly what my story was, but I was able to see what I wanted it to be and what it was going to look like. And then when I later got into actually writing the book, it was very helpful to see 
um, and to think of it as a finished project in my mind, but just keep doing it, um, you know, page by page in real life. Uh, with Cena projects, I think that it's a given that it's not going to go uh, or turn out as you think it would. And the whole project, um, I feel that the whole point is not just to create uh, a product, but just experience working on something for a long period of time and really learning from the journey. One of the hardest parts about this project was sitting down at my desk or my computer and saying, okay, create right now, be inspired right now, because that's not how inspiration works. <laughs> and one cannot force themselves to be inspired. Uh, and so before this project, I was so used to writing or drawing on my own time whenever I felt like it, but now I had to really be strict with myself and create when I wasn't feeling creative and really, you know, be like, okay, you have to get this going. And when I was about to go to sleep at night, usually that's when all my best ideas would come. So I'd be like closing my eyes and then I would wake up and reach to my bedside table, try and find a piece of paper to scribble my idea on. And then I would use that when I wasn't feeling creative. And that was sort of how my process went. Another hard part about this project was the self-doubt. I had to keep reminding myself that this whole project is a process and I'm not gonna come to all of the answers uh, that I want to come to overnight. I also doubted my ability to be able to create something wholesome and beneficial for a child. Um, I was sort of fearful that I was going to create something that didn't match up with what I was studying and blah, blah, blah. So I really had to just keep focused. I also struggled a lot with time management and also motivation. And there were some really stressful times. There were even times when I felt like, I don't want to do anymore. Why didn't I just do yoga or something? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to do this. But um, uh, there were also some wonderful times and I just had to keep pushing through it. And now I'm at the end of my project and I'm really proud of myself and happy that I kept pushing. So now getting into my book. I had a few rules for myself for this book before I even started creating the story. And those rules were, I didn't want the main character of the book to be a giant focus. And I also didn't want that character to have a name or a gender or a race because I wanted the child um, reading the book to be able to relate to that character and not have any type of boundaries. I also learned that it's really uh, beneficial to make the main character in a children's book, make them a child so that the children reading it feel connected to it and they would feel a little bit disconnected um, if the main character was an adult. I wanted the main focus of my story to also be the journey and to be moment by moment, because that is how a child of this particular age group goes through the world. And I didn't wanna force any concepts on children through my storytelling. Uh, so I kept the story very organic and I centered it mostly around nature and the natural world. This project, whew, it's taught me to be more in tune with myself and my own creativity and uh, through my studies on child development I've realized that in the future I would love to become a Waldorf teacher for kindergarten and uh, a nursery and early childhood. So that's that's the kind of thing senior projects can do. They can really change the trajectory of your life. One thing I would like to say before I wrap this up and read you my book is listen to children. Listen to children, please. Listen to them, connect with them, respect them. Because they are younger does not mean that they are less qualified um, to have opinions. They are beings just like adults. And I truly think that they know more than adults. So we can really learn from them by listening. So thank you so much. And without further ado, I will read you my story. My story is called, I Heard Something Sweet. Can you see this? It's all good? Okay. Story and illustrations by me.
The sun had set and the moon peeked its round, jolly face in through my window. I was tucked under my covers, my lights were off, and my peepers were closed. Isn't it lovely to be cozy in bed? And so I drifted off to sleep. It feels like swimming around in a pool of warm, ooey gooey honey, around and around and around. I am dreaming now. Anything can happen. I came upon a city. Some buildings were so large that not even the tallest giraffe would be able to see the top. I smelled flowers from the florist and fish from the market and coffee from the cafe and garlic from the restaurants. Everyone was moving in a bus, on a bike, on their feet, with their wings, moving, moving, moving. As I walked down the main street, I waved to everyone I saw. Doesn't it feel good to say hello? Among all the hubbub on the streets, I heard something sweet, something different from all the rest. A soft melody drifted in through the crowd, right into my ears. As I walked down the street, the melody grew a bit louder and the sound of the crowd dimmed. It sounded like melted chocolate, the breeze from a rose garden or the rhythmic bubbling of a river. I followed it for a while to a lake. As I walked closer to the lake, I realized the music was coming from within. I held my breath and dove in. Where the melody was coming from was now quite hard to trace with all of the water swirling around me. Maybe it is coming from beneath this rock, inside this shell, from this snail. I was starting to grow frustrated. My hands balled into fists and I felt very upset. I started to cry, but my tears only mixed in with the rest of the water around me. I slowly sank to the deepest part of the lake. The beautiful melody that was so sweet before seemed to taunt me. I felt that I should not follow it anymore. I guess things aren't always where you think they'll be. Suddenly I felt a rumble beneath me and the water started to lift me up and swirl me around and around. What is happening? A beautifully large whale swam towards me, kind eyes fixed on me. The whale lifted its tail and placed me upon the shore where a flower was struggling to grow. I was still quite frustrated and felt tears starting to swell in my eyes. My teardrops rolled from my eye to my cheek, to my lips, to my chin until they fell down to the earth by the flower's stem. With every teardrop, the flower grew a bit bigger and bigger. Now that I had cried, I'd felt much better. I had helped the flower grow and I had listened to feelings. I kept walking towards that enchanting melody, which now seemed to come from atop a mountain. I walked and walked and walked until I reached the tip top. I hadn't really realized how high I had climbed. I climbed so high that I could see the whole world below me. I had never been so close to the moon. Moon, do you ever wish you were the earth, green and large and a place of birth? Of course not, child, what a thing to say. I would not have it any other way. I'm entirely too busy being the moon, so shiny and so bright, like a big white balloon. Anything other than what I am would not be right. I am grateful to watch over you every night. I like being me. It's so great. There is not another me, not two, not eight. And there it was again, that ticklish melody that beckoned me on to my journey once again. So I set off. Suddenly, I realized I was not where I thought I would be. I felt lost. The trees around me were ones I hadn't seen before, 
when I couldn't see the sun anymore. Everything seemed so different. I tried to listen for the music I was following, but it was ever so soft now. I walked a bit further into the wood. I heard a rustle. I heard a crack. Who or what is crawling around me? Hello? My words went unanswered until I came to a clearing in the forest and two large magenta eyes stared at me. Since you are standing here, you might as well share who you are. I mean no harm. I seem to have gotten lost. The eyes blinked at me. I mean no harm either, child. Surely there's a solution. Might I be of assistance? The magenta eyes kept staring at me as they moved closer and closer. I could start to see who they belonged to. It was a magnificent snake with scales like a swirling sunset. The snake spoke again, exposing two needle-like fangs. Well, surely I can support you in your quest in some way, dear child. Shall I transport you to where you are headed? Well, yes, please help me out of this forest. The snake lowered its head to the ground so that I could climb on as it started to slither confidently through the trees. The light started to peek through the canopy of leaves overhead and that sweet melody resumed again, strong and clear. The snake lowered its head, bowed to me and returned into the forest. I looked in front of me. The melody started to swirl around me and I felt it fill my heart. I could hear it so clearly I knew where I needed to go. I followed it with the utmost delight. The end. All right. Before I wrap up, I have a few thank yous. Um, I would like to thank Ms. Christofides, my in-school mentor, for being incredibly supportive and inspirational and helping me with so many aspects of my project, such as editing and Zooming with me constantly <laughs> and supporting me and helping me bounce ideas and just being so incredibly helpful. So thank you, Ms. Krista Fides. I would like to thank my um, two advisors, Mr. Rowe and Ms. Volpe for being just the greatest and helping me and guiding me through this year and supporting me and my whole class, so thank you. I would like to make, thank Ms. Cologne and Ms. Monteleone, my two uh, guidance counselors for helping me, uh, you know, start this project and move through this project and really go through the year and make sure I'm on track and everything's getting done. So I thank you so much. I would like to thank Ms. Rochelle Fox for our conversation and her guidance that really opened my eyes, as, as I said, to how my project took form. So thank you so much. I would like to thank um, Sarah Perilli, my out of school mentor for being incredibly uh, supportive and inspirational and helping me uh, with so many aspects and helping me find out what my true, um, my true goal is with this project. So thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, my parents, Sky and Eileen, for being the best and supporting me um, in every way you can support a person. They have helped so much with this project and helping me stay on track. And when I'm feeling discouraged, they lift me up and I, I value that so much. So thank you. And I would also like to thank my dad for helping me lay out this whole book. Um, and helping me with all the techie stuff and just both of them for giving me the tools to create this project. I would like to thank my friends in school and out of school for supporting me, giving me guidance, for listening to me and encouraging me and helping me 
and loving me and supporting me. So thank you so much. I would like to thank my incredible and chaotic and silly class. Um, you all have, have been through, we've been through so much this year and it's been a pleasure to get to know some of you even more and to be continue this journey with um, others. And I'm so incredibly proud of each of and every, and every one of you. And when I say my class, I also mean people who um, were in our class before this year as well. So thank you to everyone. I finally would like to thank Green Meadow, thank my Waldorf education and just this whole school and this community that really helped me feel um, connected and guided and happy and educated and it's been a pleasure to be at this school. So thank you everybody. That was truly incredible, Lizzie. Lee. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, your book is, is amazing. And people are asking, are you going to be selling it? <laughs> so <laughs> at the beginning of this project, I was, you know, I, I just wanted to create the book, but since I sort of found a different track, I wasn't able to self-publish it. That was originally my main goal, but I'm taking a gap year this year. So I hope to self-publish it and then um, sell it or, or gift it to friends and family. So let me know if you're interested, if that happens. <laughs> okay, Ms. Caldwell said your illustrations are breathtaking. They are so <laughs> light and free. How did you find your style? Um, Oil pastel was so amazing to work with. And the way that, you know, if, you're, if you are drawing with oil pastel, which I used to hate oil pastel, but if you're drawing with it, it just sort of, you know, you saw a lot of like swirls and curlicues and things. It really just like guides you. Um, I, you know, both of my parents are artists, so I have a lot of art in my life and a lot of inspiration. So I, I sort of just, gathered it from that. It's very odd. It's sort of, you go into the drawing part and then before you know it, there's a page in front of you. So a lot of different things that um, have helped me and also just being interested in art myself. Great. Thank you. Are, are you planning on writing another children's book? Ooh. <laughs> um, <laughs> possibly in the future. Um, at the beginning of the project, I said I wanted to create something that I could possibly never do again. But since this was so uh, transformative for me, uh, I could possibly do it again. I really enjoyed it. So, but probably not for a few years. I got to like calm down. <laughs> okay, Julia, this was a great project. I'm so happy I was able to see and listen to it. What inspired your storyline? What inspired my storyline? Um, well, I wanted to create something in the natural world. And I also wanted to create something that was a journey. I didn't want there to be um, certain, certain like, like, how do I say this? I wanted it to move smoothly through the story. And I also wanted there, I didn't really want there to be a, a part of the story that was really scary or something really bad happened because I don't believe that you have to have something bad um, in, in stories or in life to have excitement. So I think that uh, I, I read a lot of children's books. I got inspiration from there, but it's really hard. To, it's hard to say. It just sort of comes in. It's not like I get an idea it really develops over weeks and thinking and thinking and then suddenly it's there. Uh, what was your favorite children's book as a child? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's this one, so I mentioned before, Molin Shrew, if you give a, give a moose a muffin. Uh, I love Dr. Seuss. There's a Dr. Seuss book called Something with Sleep. I think it's sleeping or I don't know, but my dad had that when he was a child and he gave it to me. So we would read that together. Um, what else? I really, there's, there's some things. Um, I like the book when Sophie gets really, really angry. I think that's the title. Uh, 
books like Frog and Toad, and um, also a, a great, okay, I'm just remembering this now, I'll go back to that question. A huge inspiration for me was the author and illustrator Myra Kalman. If you haven't checked out her books, I really, really hope you do. Her illustrations are so amazing, and I'm just remembering that now that I get got a lot of inspiration from her books, and I just, I have, I think, almost all of her books, and I still read them today because they're so interesting, so I recommend books. Great. Did you do the illustrations as you went or after you finished? I, so, so I did um, sort of inspiration, writing down storylines, child development, and then writing my story, and then uh, doing my drawings. Very, very late. <laughs> Um, it was a bit of a time crunch, but uh, that, that sort of was the process and it felt very natural and I felt like that was a good way to do it. And I mean, I was studying child development through the whole thing, but uh, to sort of have that information and then go on to writing my book was really helpful. What do you think you've learned about yourself through this project, artistically or spiritually or in any other sense? And how have you seen your perspective grow and change as a result of the process? Wow, oh, great question. I'm going to look and see who's writing these because I, I, if we were in Rose Hall, I would be seeing. <laughs> that, one um, was but... hmm? that one was anonymous. That one was anonymous. Okay. Oh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, hmm. Definitely a lot. Um, sort of more practical things like motivation, time management, even though that was a struggle, I did learn a lot. And learning, um, being okay with things not going as expected. And just a lot of, um, you know, looking into anthroposophy and studying that and seeing that it lines up with a lot of my beliefs and a lot of my spiritual beliefs too um, helped me a lot in this project. And so I feel like it almost um, brought out and supported things that were already in my consciousness, but I just needed to give, shed a little light on them. And I just kept realizing all these new things about myself that I can't really remember right now, but I know that throughout the project, it was really, um, it was very transformative and exciting and and I, I'm such a different person than I was at the beginning of the project, which is really interesting. And to see how, as I grow, um, the project grows as well. And so it's, it's sort of sad to say goodbye, but I have this book, so that's good. And I have all the knowledge. <laughs> um, do you see yourself following a career in writing or illustration or a different career path? I don't think I see myself following a career in writing. Um, writing, obviously, I, I really enjoy it, but I, I really like illustrating better. And I, I, don't, I don't think I would, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I love art. I want to I become sort of devote a part of my life to art. And, but I'm, I'm not sure if I see going into that as a career. I see more of becoming a Waldorf teacher and then weaving in the things that I've learned in this project into that work as well. But I will definitely keep writing and illustrating in my personal life. Okay, Mr. Rose says the art and story are very beautiful. After this process, do you have moments you now experience that feel like they are more like those of a child? If so, do you think that will persist? Oh, interesting. Can you just read the last? Oh, here we go. Um, mm. Mr. Rowe. Um, I think that through this, I really realized um, how, how much we lack as adults and how much children have. And to really think about different things in my life and think about um, sort of like, what would a child do? And you have much more fun when you think that way. If you're outside and you're walking by a stream, you know, um, jump in. And, <laughs> and to also sort of look at things very compassionately and connected uh, with other people and with the world. And to really, to really see, see the world as something magical. And I really don't want to lose that as I grow older. I want to always feel 
the magic that is in the world and in everything and every being. So I also feel that being at Green Meadow has really fostered that in me of keeping that alive um, throughout the year. So, so it, it I, I almost forgot the question, but <laughs> um, I, I think that it's a muscle that you have to work on to stay childish <laughs> um, in the best way. So, yeah. Which page was the most fun to draw from Erica? Ooh, I should have gotten the pages to show, but um, hmm. I really, should I show again? Maybe I'll show it again. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oop. Okay, I'm not gonna waste time by trying to figure this out. Um, my first, <laughs> I um, hopefully will be able to upload this maybe as an ebook or something so people can go back and see. But one of my favorite illustrations was the first illustration that I did. Um, the first page, which is little um, child in their bed and then it's sort of swirling around and there's the moon and I based that off of my own bedroom. So that was fun and that was the first drawing that I did and it was kind of surprising because I didn't expect the first one to be my favorite but it really is. Um, I really also like the one with the whale. I love whales and the eye and the flower. So those are my favorites and the city, the town. What made you want to write children's books? <laughs> I, it's hard to tell. Um, I, at the end of junior year, I was sort of making a list with my friends and going energy medicine, yoga, sil aerial silks, opera singing, and it just came to me. And that's how a lot of things in this project just comes to me from some divine force that just pops this idea in my mind. Um, and I don't know, but I, I think I thought, oh, that would be cool. And I have tried to write like children's books when I was in middle school and, but they obviously weren't to this extent, but I, I like writing stories. And so maybe it, it just, just sort of popped up. Were you working on this all through the year or did you take breaks sometimes? Break. <laughs> I took a large break um, with college applications because that was obviously very overwhelming. Miss Wolby, we had a talk and she was like, you, you have to take, you have to stop. So from like maybe December and January, I took time off and it was hard to get back into it, but it was really helpful to help recharge. And with senior project, it's always something on your mind. It's always something you're thinking about, at least for me. So it was helpful to sort of just take that off and focus on school. So um, yeah, and then also in the summer of junior year, I um, took breaks and I, I was thinking about it constantly, but there were times like weeks that I just didn't work on it at all, so. Ms. Fleischmanston said, that was amazing research. How did it change your relationship to young children and could you ever imagine to work with them? Thank you for being here. Um, I, it, it's just helped me so much and also um, helped me relate to other people, just, just to everybody, because children find that so easy. They walk up to you and be like, hey, like I, my, my cat is blue and you're like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so they really don't have that boundary and it's really nice to connect to people in that way. And so um, I'm just gonna look at the, so, uh, to, so I do a lot of babysitting and um, working out at camp and it really, it really, um, it's, it's hard sometimes to not get fed up with children and, and, um, <laughs> and they can be very um, uh, enthusiastic and sometimes you're not in that headspace. But really to get out of that, get out of all of this of like, oh, I have things to do and take care of and actually see and listen to children, as I, as I said. So yes, and, and becoming a teacher would, would be part of that and would be very valuable. And I can attest that you are amazing at that, Lazuli. You're really able to connect with children in a beautiful way. Thank you. Um, did Miss Burchell Fox talk to you about oral storytelling um, without the use of pictures as well? Um, hi, Miss Montani. Mm -hmm. um, 
we didn't talk about, not that I remember, we didn't talk about, because I know that is a, a big thing in um, the early childhood in Waldorf and how you read stories and that certain voice you have. Um, but we didn't really talk about that. I talked about it with Miss Christophides and she helped me with the rhythm of my voice and, and how to go through that. And also my um, mom is a teacher and she sometimes reads stories to kindergarten. So she helped me with that too and how to make it like interesting and different voices. Um, so that was really helpful. Are there any other styles of books you like? Comic books? Anything like I really like, um, I, I don't, I don't read many comic books. I, I don't read any comic books actually. Um, although I think they're truly amazing and that's a whole other language to be able to, um, it's almost like children's books, but it's a little bit different, I feel. So, um, but I love, I mean, I love reading and fiction and uh, spiritual books and reading, you know, the lectures and the, also those picture books that are just pictures are really um, interesting to me. And I actually debated having my book like that, but I ended up adding the text. Okay, two more questions. Do okay. you think you will one day make another story building on your drawing Nyack in Sweden? And you can process got you more connected to your childhood and your inner self. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, here it is again. <laughs> <100 feet. laughs> um, that would be really interesting. And I hadn't thought about that, but that's something that really interests, interests me now. And that's something to think about. I mean, I did look back at a lot of drawings that I had made as a child to sort of get inspiration and, and get that sort of loopy, swirly quality. Um, and also, what was the second part of the question? Sorry. You think through this process, you got more connected to your childhood and inner self. Yeah, definitely. Um, my family, we have a lot of home videos of myself when I was a child. So watching those are also um, always very fun. And thinking back to my childhood self and, and seeing her um, as a teacher. And, um, and just through this project, it really opened my eyes to my own um, development as a human being and seeing, oh my gosh, that did happen. That makes sense. I did feel that at that age. So that was really interesting. Okay, last question. Is there something you learned that you would tell your ninth grade self? Oh, oh man. <laughs> if anybody who knows me in ninth grade, that was a year. Um, <laughs> I think that hmm a lot of things because ninth grade was a very transformative year. And then after that year, I came into Green Meadow. Um, know that things will get better. And also to listen to truly what you feel. I feel that there's a lot of distraction of, oh, try to be like this, try to be like that, um, do this, do that. But at that age, I feel like um, you're really finding finding your groove and you will come into it. And um, really to sort of push that self doubt out of your head and to appreciate, um, to appreciate art and to appreciate how saving, how, much, how it can save somebody and to connect with, um, with, with everybody more and not really have that fear of connection. So a lot of things, that's just a few. There's a lot of things. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank all three of our presenters for doing such an incredible job today, Jonah Hunter and Lazuli. It was really a treat to, to have all of your presentations and we're so glad we had such an amazing turnout, over 150 people at some point. So this was really incredible that we got to share this with the community. Um, despite it having to be virtual. And I'm glad that we have touched so many people. And I'm sure we'll be sharing um, some information on how to maybe access uh, your book, Lazuli, and your work, Hunter, um, and maybe your band, Jonah. So um, thank you all very much. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Ms. Cologne, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>